And welcome back to the Dino Vidala Show. Right now, very happy to have on Mehdi Hassan, award-winning journalist for years, host of MSNBC, Al Jazeera, and other places, author of the great book, which we talked about on our show, Win Every Argument, and recently started a new media company, Zetao. Zetao, right? Which Zetao. Is a Greek word. Zetao. And it's yeah. a Greek word? It is an ancient Greek word, which means to seek out, to look for something, to look for the truth. Very nice. You're the perfect guy to do it. Mehdi, it's good to see you, my friend. I know you've been you've been still vocal and loud on the social media platforms, both threads and Twitter. Uh, but now I'm glad. Congratulations on your new company. I think this is great. Thank you so much, Dean. It was something I had to do. We're in an election year. We've got a war going on, a genocide, many of us would argue, going on. And I wasn't really going to sit back and be silent. And I thought, what better to do than start my own platform, have that freedom that I've always wanted. I'm in my 40s now. I get to say whatever I want and be my own boss. It's a great That's thing. great. I look forward to corporate media buying your outlet and then you being back into... No, I'm kidding. <laughs> when, <laughs> you're like, corporate media... What? What was that? Comcast offered me $5 million? What was it? What was that about the check? Okay, then. Oh, that's right. Okay, I think so. No, it's ironic because I bemoan corporate media every day. I'm on a platform owned by Sirius Pandora, which is owned by Liberty Media, which is publicly traded. I mean, it is it is corporate media, but I have more freedom because as opposed to say... MS or something where there's only one show on. There are so many shows on. No one can keep the executives can't keep track. So unless I get in trouble, <laughs> you can do anything here. This is kind of remarkable. Let's not get you in trouble today, Dean. We're gonna try not to. So you've been very outspoken about the humanity of the people in Gaza. And you know, obviously October 7th, horrific terrorist attack. What we've seen in response has been unlike anything I've ever seen, though, in my life in the Middle East. And that the you know, 30,000 dead in a matter of months. Two thirds of those are estimated to be women and children, over 10,000, 11,000 children killed. Two million people have been displaced. Almost the entire population of Gaza has been displaced. And have you ever seen any like this? And, and is it shocking that in 2024, this world, that we can see something that seems like out of something out of the history books? And people said, why didn't they still speak out about it? Yeah. No, it's a great question. And we do often wonder, what would we have done if we were alive during Vietnam and during all the things that people protested over? Well, now's your moment. Now's your chance. I've, As you know, I've covered uh, wars in the Middle East. I've covered the geopolitics of the Middle East for many years now. I marched against the Iraq war in 2003, and that was a very formative moment for me. And the Iraq war was a horror show. Uh, the Syrian civil war was a horror show. Yemen was bad. But if you talk to UN humanitarian chiefs, you talk to the current guy, Martin Griffiths, he says it's the worst for 50 years, worse than Yemen, worse than Syria. You have to go back to Cambodia under the Khmer Rouge, he says, to get a humanitarian crisis this bad. You talk to his predecessor, he says it's the worst of his lifetime. You talk to the former UN human rights chief who said recently on the BBC that this is the worst kill rate, the level of daily killing since the Rwandan genocide in the mid 1990s. So just to put that in perspective for your audience, there really has been nothing like this. Oxfam says it's the highest daily rate of killing of women and children of any conflict of the 21st century. And we, you and I, Dean, and your listeners are paying for it. That's the big problem. We are complicit in it. This is not something we're watching as disinterested observers from far away. This is something that we are paying for and arming and funding day after day. 30,000 dead. And I would point out President Biden in a recent MSNBC interview with my former colleague, Jonathan Capehart, referred to 30,000 dead. He now accepts those numbers, which at the beginning he was trying to doubt. Yes, he did. He said, I have no notion the Palestinians are telling the truth about the death toll. Now, That's now he accepts him, numbers like everyone that, else. Now, he does. I will say this. I've never seen more outspoken, more people being outspoken in Congress about it. Well, I wish it was more. It is more than in the past. And Senator Van Hollen going on the floor and saying yes. war crimes, saying this is war crimes. It's not like something I've ever heard before in, in terms of, of these conflicts. Does it give you any hope that perhaps the Democratic Party is finally waking up, at least the base of the Democratic Party is waking up and now it's manifesting in certain elected officials? I mean, the polling tells us the base has been against this war and for a ceasefire for a long time. In fact, one poll shows 50 percent of Democrats say there's a genocide going on in Gaza, mm -hmm. which is interesting because Joe Biden told Jonathan Capard on MSNBC that this is just the media. This is just activists. Most people don't think it's a genocide. Well, actually, 50 percent of his base do. And that's despite all the pro-Israeli media coverage, which is kind of hiding the truth from a lot of Americans. I would also point out that, you know, for those Muslims and Arab Americans listening to your show, Dean, I, I hear a lot from my community that, you know, they're all the same. And look, on Gaza, unfortunately, President Biden has been as bad as 
President Trump would have been. Uh, I think it's indistinguishable right now in terms of which parties in the White House when it comes to backing Israel blindly. But as you say, in Congress, in the Senate, in the House, there are voices speaking out. And guess what, Dean? They're all from one party. Right. They're There's no Republicans Democrats. calling for a ceasefire. There are 70 members of Congress, I think, now calling for a ceasefire. Zero Republicans. In fact, Republicans are going around saying genocidal stuff in hallways to activists. I don't know if you saw that member of Congress recently saying good yes. Palestine or goodbye Gaza. I can already say. Uh, absolutely. And there was a Republican member of the House. I'm just looking for the person's name who just subpoenaed the UAW for daring to call for a ceasefire because they want to get to the bottom of this. And they were calling and the Republican actually said calling for a ceasefire is anti-Semitic. And the person, of course, wasn't Jewish because very few Jewish people would agree with that idea that calling for a ceasefire Dean, because the leading voices are Jewish voice for peace are young Jews and middle aged yeah. Jews and older Jews were in the streets demanding not in their name. So it, it, the, the Christian evangelical right who wants Jesus to come back. So all the Jews disappear and all the Muslims disappear are not the best allies for one of the one Republican them. congressman Dean turned up at the start of the conflict in an IDF uniform in Congress, which is Brian funny. Because this, is the, this is the America first party, but they're happy to wear a foreign military uniform. Imagine if Rashida Tlaib turned up in like PA security uniform. Palestine. Well, that's Congressman Brian Mass from Florida, who is also also said that there are not so many innocent people in Gaza. He said that on the floor of the House. Yes, so he said Nazis had kids too. Yes, and he served in the IDF. He served in the U.S. military, then the IDF, and it tells you that that's the mindset of many in the IDF. I imagine that they're all the enemy. Because look, you know, look, if you can drop, as CNN has confirmed this by satellite imagery. They dropped over five hundred two thousand pound bombs in Gaza, one of the most densely populated areas bombs. in the world. 2,000 pound bombs, which kill people a thousand feet away, a quarter of a mile away. So even if in good faith, you say Gaza's here, you're killing everyone in the apartment building across the street and behind them and over there. You only do that when everybody else is not viewed as a human being. Because if and, you view and, them and as human beings, you don't drop that bomb. And that's key, Dean, because the American relationship with Israel ostensibly is based on shared values. That's what we're told, right? We support Israel because they're the only democracy in the Middle East and we share their values. Unfor now, even if you buy that explanation, which personally I don't, but let's say we do buy that explanation, those values are no longer shared, right? There's no scenario in which Americans sign up for what some of the Israeli government ministers are saying. People like Smotrich, Ben Gavir, who say we're proud homophobes, proud fascists, proud racists. These are their words. Um, and then I, I did a story uh, for my new media venture for Zeteo on Monday about this rabbi in Jaffa who teaches young Israelis who are going to serve in the IDF, in the Israeli military, in Gaza. And he did a speech last Thursday saying, we've got to kill everyone in Gaza. There are no innocents. And he was asked, what about the babies? If babies grow up to be terrorists. Kill them all. That was the message he put out. And this guy is teaching young Israelis who are going to serve in the military. That's the mindset. We're paying, by the way, for this rabbi because we fund the Israeli government who fund the rabbi. Also, you can send tax deductible donations thanks to the US tax code to his organization in Israel. That's an outrage. Those are not shared values. Americans should not be supporting that. And I would argue Americans would not want to support that if they knew. And I grew up always with the idea of people in the Palestinian American community saying if they only knew, Americans only knew, they would change. And I wasn't always sure, but I could see a big swath of Americans would change their view. I've never had more conversations on my show and from African Americans, especially. Yes. And young, and young people American who are Jews, Jews, as you said. Right. And, and and young progressive Jews and middle aged progressive Jews, people of color calling up, you know, they had over a thousand black pastors, as New York Times documented about a month and a half yeah. ago, sent a letter to Biden. The AME Church, one of the biggest black denominations, not only called for a ceasefire, called for a temporary pause of military aid to Netanyahu. And in the article, the things that stuck with me, and I also mentioned this to Blinken, was the African-Americans were saying, we know what an oppressed people looks like, and they're an oppressed people, and that's why we feel a connection. And others saying, we've not seen this level of emotion since the civil rights movement. It has touched people in the, the black community, brown community, well, it's uh, it's white It's not a coincidence, liberals. Dean, that South Africa was the country that took Israel to the International Court of Justice. Uh, what, it wasn't a coincidence that South Africa, what, I couldn't hear the last part. I said, it's not a coincidence that it was South Africa that took Israel to the International Court of Justice. Right. And it's not a coincidence that uh, Israel violated UN resolutions and continued to support the Afrikaner government, the white supremacist government in South mm -hmm. Africa with literally resolutions, right? And this is old. This is Israel from the 1980s, not now, but 1980s doing that in violation. 
And they said, well, they're, they felt like they were a pariah nation, Israel, and they were like, South Africa, we can deal with them. They were giving them weaponry. People don't forget that. People can Google and they can see yep. the reality. I'm chatting with my friend Mehdi Hassan. So Mehdi, look, President Biden's language has changed dramatically. They're going to build a pier for humanitarian aid. And I know on some level, we're going to give them the food on the beach and weapons on the land to Netanyahu. So it doesn't make sense that way. There's a lot of ironies involved here. But it is a dramatic shift. Do you think this happens if it wasn't for, and it's not just the uncommitted, it's not just Muslims and Arabs. I keep telling people, it's African-Americans, Latinos, yes. young Jewish people, progressive whites. It's the Democratic coalition who 80% in recent polls wants a ceasefire yes. pressuring Biden. Do you think this is a response to, to that? I think the change in rhetoric is certainly a response to that. We've seen that from Kamala Harris. We've seen that from President Biden. The peer thing, I'm not so sure about. There's a lot of conflicting reporting on that. There's now reporting out of Israel, Dean, that suggests Netanyahu wanted this, and Netanyahu is the one who pitched the peer as a way of avoiding uh, land borders and keeping the Israeli military out of it. Um, you know, the Israelis have wanted to destroy UNRWA, the UN aid agency, refugee agency in Gaza, for a long time. They mm -hmm. persuaded the Americans to cut aid based on this BS reporting that 12 UNRWA staffers took part in the October 7th attacks. They provided no evidence of that. US intelligence community says they have low confidence in that Israeli view. But Anthony Blinken, who you went to see, has said it was highly credible claims. Not highly credible, in fact. So, look, in, when it comes to the aid situation, we're not doing enough. No, we're near enough. When it comes to rhetoric, it is changing in the right direction. But again, some would argue too little, too late. Some would argue it needs to go much further. We are in an election year. Uh, put aside morality, just from a pure political partisan point of view, I do tear my hair out and wonder, Who's advising this guy? Like, what are people in the White House thinking? When they put out that statement, Dean, on the 100 days of the war, and they didn't mention any dead Palestinians, and then they had to kind of walk it back, and their deputy national security advisor went to Dearborn and apologized to some Arab Americans. What are you doing writing a statement? It doesn't cost you anything to acknowledge the tens of thousands of Palestinian dead. The fact that they couldn't even mention that in a statement both shows a lack of empathy, but worse from a political point of view, it just shows you're bad at your jobs in an election year when you need votes in Michigan, not just Michigan, Georgia. I was in Atlanta recently, Dean. That's mm -hmm. where Donald Trump lost to Joe Biden by 11,000 votes. We know that because he rang up the secretary of state and said, find me 11,000 votes. Well, there's a huge Muslim community in Atlanta and some of those cities in Georgia. There's a huge black community, as you say, profiled in the New York Times. Democrats are crazy if they're not worried about what's going to happen in these states with razor thin margins. Well, I think in the case of Joe Biden, he's long said that he's proud to be a Zionist. You don't, he says that you don't have to be Jewish to be a Zionist. And I think that's his go to. And now things have changed. And I even know some members of Congress whose districts have shifted. And before they could be just completely pro Israel. And now there's a growing Muslim community and people of color in their community. Now they're navigating a new world. So some of them are adapting and they're better at it. <laughs> Biden is not. And by the way, with the UN Relief Works Agency, the one thing I will say is Blinken, and this is true because I looked it up later, he is a long, long time supporter of the UN Relief Works Agency. They said they paused it because Congress was going to pass a law to bar any aid. So they said, we're going to do this to keep the temperature down. And they had just given a big tranche of money. And, yeah, and, and the problem with that, Dean, is I, I would buy that if it wasn't for the fact that he also said the claims against UNRWA were highly credible. And we now know the US intelligence community right. does not support him. And that's the kind of crap that we saw George Bush and co during, did during the Iraq war. We've seen that many times before where the intel doesn't match the public statements. But look, yes, the Biden administration came in and restored aid to UNRWA, which Trump right. had cut in 2018. There, right. I think they restored a billion dollars, which was, you know, laudable. But taking, you know, taking Netanyahu's word, I mean, look, the big question here, Dean, for your listeners, for Democrats, for the White House, for Congress, why on earth is Joe Biden hitching his re-election prospects and the future of American democracy. You and I both know Trump is an existential threat to American democracy. Why is he hitching that to Benjamin Netanyahu's fate? I do not understand it. People who are allied to Biden don't understand it. Pro-Israel Democrats, Dean, it's not just pro-Palestinian. Right. There are pro-Israel Democrats. Uh, Senator, um, uh, what's his name? Uh, Michael Bennett. Uh, was on was on MSNBC this morning, I believe. And I saw a clip of him on social media. I think he was on MS saying Netanyahu can't be trusted. Like Democrats who are pro-Israel are saying to the White House, what are you doing getting into bed with Netanyahu? What are you doing with this bear hug to Netanyahu? Netanyahu wants a Trump presidency. So what on yeah. earth are you doing hitching your re-election prospects to BBs? Makes no sense. I'm sorry. I, I agree. He has long been part of the GOP apparatus. He was disrespectful and racist to Barack Obama. 
And there were people I screwed over articles. every Democratic president of our lifetime. Bill Clinton came out of a meeting with Netanyahu and said, who the F is the superpower here? Right. Every Democratic president of our lifetime, Netanyahu was screwed over. So what on earth That's is it. going on here? And by the way, the one thing about the U.N. Relief Works Agency, because, again, I can quote what I said, is that when they said, well, we have allegations that some people involved in the U.N. Relief Works Agencies were involved in terrorism. I go, well, Ben Kavir was convicted in Israeli court in 2007 of actually being a terrorist and supporting a terrorist organization. So why are we funding an or a government with one of the heads well is a terrorist? And so it's it's funny, the more research you do, the more it becomes uncomfortable for those who are just... Well, if you watch any of, uh, I don't know Matthew Miller, and he's a, he's a sharp guy, the State Department spokesman. If you watch his briefings every day these days, they're a car crash. Every reporter is asking pretty simple questions about why aren't we conditioning aid? Why aren't we holding Israel to account? And he's just dodging and ducking and weaving. And it's not great. It's, it's almost Sean Spicer level. He's got, I mean, and he's do. he gets his marching orders. He was in the meeting, He's defending by the, way. the indefensible. And, the right, it's, kind of, it's kind of remarkable. I'm talking about Mehdi. So Mehdi, in the last few minutes here, I'll talk about 2024 race and then talk about your, your new media company. You touched on it, the threat of fascism that we have yes. right on U.S. soil. Do you think Jamie Raskin and some Democrats have been really good on talk? Yes. Point, today, Congressman Raskin in the Robert Hurd Committee hearing saying fascism and Nazism. And he goes, how Americans, this is the distraction what they're doing here. Here's a threat. Most Democrats won't mention Trump is charged with 32 counts of violating the Espionage Act. Every day should be Espionage Act, Espionage Act. Every day it should be the coup. Yeah. Imagine if Biden was charged with 91 felonies. What the I mean, right we would can be play the Imagine If game all day long. Imagine if Barack Obama right. had stolen do national security documents. Imagine if Hillary Clinton said, I want to be a dictator for one hour, let alone one day. Imagine if Joe Biden had said, you know, foreign people are poisoning our blood and was quoting Hitler. It would just be the end of the world. He gets away with murder because he's Donald Trump and the media grade him on a curve. And the media now have decided, I don't know if you saw the CNBC interview uh, with Donald I Trump. Heard some of that yesterday. Just, I felt like we'd gone back in time to 2015. He gets on the phone and rambles and lies and no one really holds him to account or even tries to hold him to account. Uh, we're in a very dangerous place. I thought in 2020, the media had learned some of the lessons of 2016 and did a bit of a better job. Bit of a better, not much better, but a bit of a better. I think we've now regressed and almost like we've gone back beyond 2020 to 2016, where Trump is now this candidate. He's the insurgent. He's the populist. We show his rallies. He's the anti the system. Joe Biden is the Democratic incumbent. We're not happy with Joe Biden. So we give Trump a path. It's all very depressing and very dangerous. The man says he wants to be a dictator. The man is quoting Adolf Hitler. The man is on trial for multiple crimes. And yet he gets on the phone with CNBC and it's kind of like, well, what's your tariff policy? Who cares what his tariff policy is? I cannot believe how the media has normalized Donald Trump because he's good for Again. revenue and ratings. And it's there is no and I think I think it's malpractice. I think, if you write an article about bin Laden, you don't leave out 9-11. Yes. You don't about Trump. You don't leave out exactly. January 6th, well folks. Ja the guy, and also, he, and also, he's out on bail. Also, Maybe when he's you out write on about bail. Laden, when you wrote about bin Laden, people called him a terrorist, right? Right, like, exactly. Trump's was. a terrorist. Of, I say it all the time. Reasons, one of the reasons I say, I, look, and I said this in my when I announced my new venture, one of the reasons I started Zateo was, Frustratingly, in our media, we hide behind lazy euphemisms. You and I have talked about this on air many times. Sure. The both sidesism, the cowardice, uh, the, the normalizing. And I said, look, we're going to use the F word, fascism. We're going to use the R word, racism. We're not going to say it's racially tinged. No, it's racist stuff that he says. We're going to say the G word, genocide, which is what the ICJ says is plausibly happening in Gaza. As journalists, let's have some respect for our audiences and say it as it is. Let's not hide behind lazy euphemisms. So as someone who worked in the corporate media world, it is, I mean, is there pressure? Uh, share whatever you can. I mean, I'm not trying to get you to say anything, uh, honestly, I'm your friend. So whatever you, but is there pressure to to be within certain parameters, e expressly or implicitly, even, you know, Producers going, look, if you say that, Mehdi, it's probably going to cause a backlash here internally in that kind of forceful, blunt language where there's no place for timidity when the stakes are this high, folks. That's right. So was there ever or did you feel no. 
Did you have to self-censor? Would, look, what I would say, Dean, is in any in, in all mainstream media organizations right now, there are debates being had about how far you can go in describing what is happening in front of our eyes. There are debates being had about can you call Trump a fascist? There was always that debate, Dean. Do you remember? Well, you can't say he's a liar because you don't know what's in his heart. You don't know what his intent is, which is BS. So I've always pushed back against that. I pushed back against that at MSNBC. I pushed back against that when I worked at Al Jazeera English at the BBC. My entire career has been pushing back against people saying, well, you can't say that. We shouldn't say that what about the backlash and i would just say look that's one of the reasons i love being uh, my own boss and running my own media company because now i can do and say it how it, i think it should be done i can also say this is how journalism is it sp- supposed to be and look of course if you work in any environment you get normalized to that environment and i've said openly i've talked about this i talked about this when i was at msnbc which is we have a u.s media across the board not just msnbc but all the med- liberal media organizations where journalists have to value things like access, they have to value norms, conventions, things which are fine in normal times, but not in the current era. Access, you can't be trying to value access to the Trump campaign over speaking truth about the Trump campaign. Norms and conventions where the media has to get a quote from both sides don't work when one side just gaslights permanently 24 uh, seven or, or even tries to dox the reporter or threaten them with violence. So all of those old fashioned norms and conventions that NBC and CNN and ABC and the BBC and New York Times, they just don't work anymore. And again, that's one of the reasons I said I'm going it alone. I agree. And Edward R. Murrow famously said, I'm slightly paraphrasing, but there's not two sides to every story. Yeah. And he knew that. And a lot talking about like Nazis and things. There are not two sides. You don't have to. I'll, I'll, and then I want you to bring up your company. I remember once CNN, a morning show during the time of Trump, called because I, I still write for CNN once a week. Like I, I do freelance everywhere. But I would go on a lot more. And they were going to have me on talk about the Trump ban. And, and I go, OK. And they go, well, you just have to get someone to find someone to be on the other side. I go, someone in favor of discriminating against Muslims, that's what you, you want to find that. Or no, it was actually worse, it was bigotry. Trump said something really bigoted. And they go, well, we need someone on the other side. Also, you're gonna have someone who's gonna come on and say, it's okay to say Islam hates us. I'm like, am I missing something? And then the person got uncomfortable and they call me back 10 minutes later. We're not doing the segment. So instead of just having me on alone, they didn't yeah. do the segment. They got better. It is, they got it, better it, at time on that, that was part bad. Of that is, part of that is horrible J school practices, which says you have to have two sides to every story. And they're not, as you say, you know, Joe Biden won the election. There are no two sides to the 2020 election. Climate change is real. There's no two sides to that. Holocaust denial. There's no two sides to the Holocaust, right? Basic stuff. And I always say, look, I wrote a book about debating, win every argument. I always say, look, I love debating. I love arguing, but I'm not going to debate with people who say up is down, black is white, hot is cold. Like there's certain reality-based uh, premises you just are not going to debate. So Mehdi, tell us about your new company and the new morning show, Mehdi and Dean. It's going to be, in the, no, I'm kidding. <laughs> That's in the future. When this thing grows, huh? we're all going to be, all the Muslims in the media, we're all going to Mehdi's. Dean, Dean so, there's an open me. invitation for you. All uh, right, we're uh, waiting. I'm Zeteo, uh, spelled Z-E-T-E-O, and I'm going to do a shameless plug, Zeteonews.com, Z-E-T-E-O-News.com. You can go subscribe. It's a subscription-based platform. We're not trying to rely on advertisers. We've already had over 110,000 free subscribers in the first 10 days, uh, a bunch of paid subscribers which is helping pay uh pay for our investment in podcasts shows articles it's all coming soon april is the big launch uh we're going to be launching a streaming show a podcast i'm going to be unveiling around six to eight pretty big name uh interesting contributors which i think your listeners and people on the progressive side will find fascinating the point is to try and have as many conversations and to speak as freely and as unfiltered as possible about some of the big issues of our time fascism racism genocide uh, and that's that is the real purpose in 2024. It's a very simple mission. And if people want to sign up, they go to Substack or where can they go? Yeah, they go to zateonews.com forward slash subscribe and you get multiple offers. You can pay for less than a cup of coffee a month. Uh, you can be free for a start to check it out. You can become a founding member. As I say, the big launch is next month. We're doing a little bit of content now in this soft launch promotional period, but we're really working hard to get the studios up and running to get the staff in place so that we can actually provide an all singing, all dancing media um, uh, opportunity and platform. That's great. And I'm very excited for you. I wish you the best. And Zateo.news. So Zateonews.com. Subscribe. Best wishes, brother. And I look Thank forward you. to chat with you as time goes on. I look forward to the to one day doing something with you. We'll, we'll see how that all works. Inshallah. 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 And Ramadan Mubarak. I'll take care. Ramadan Mubarak to you, brother. Take care. Thank you.